Roberts is a young man who has starred in more than 100 major motion pictures and television shows. He has been honored with a list of credits too long to mention. We are going to meet Roberts and his wife, Eliza Garrett, also an actress, a writer, and his personal manager at home in Los Angeles. But this interview is more than a story about a show business couple. This is an interview about ideas and thoughts and problems. This couple wants to talk about what's right and what's wrong in America and the world. Eric Roberts is passionate about the war in Iraq and about political problems that we face here at home. You're going to hear some very, very personal conversation between Eric and Eliza right here on Bruce W. Cook Interviews. Your filmography is 42 pages long, so you have certainly not <laughs> lacked for work. But would you say it's been a very pleasurable ride, or has it been tough? had its good days and its bad days, like anything else. Like anything else in the whole world, it's what you make of it. And I know that sounds so corny. So then what have you made of it? What are you most proud of? Out of a hundred and some odd films, more than 40% of those maybe I'm proud of. That's pretty good maybe ratio. Maybe 20% I should be proud of, but I'm proud of maybe 40%. Because I know what I had to go through in order to a accomplish what I did, and it isn't always what I s set out to accomplish, but it's okay because I'm proud of it, because I didn't miss totally. You steal the scenes you're in, for oh, the most you. part, my humble, pandering mm -hmm. opinion. <laughs> I mean, on close-up, that camera loves your face. Mm -hmm. It gets beneath you, the emotion comes through. You have a gift. Well, thank you. You have a great gift. Thank you so much. But I don't think it's been exposed enough. And I don't think it's your fault. The movies out there mm -hmm. are, for the most part, pure trash. And I have to say, if I was an actor, I'd be depressed. Because the choices are so limited. Mm -hmm. How much power and control do you have to say, I want to do something better? Okay, well, if you look at all the movies, all my filmography that will also tell you I have had no power or control. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just, just the way it goes. Uh, yeah, but uh, you've been recognized, Academy Award, all Golden kinds Globes, of honors. Yeah. So how long have you been married? Almost Twelve years. years. It's working? I'm his manager too. But you have a very complicated life and career. Actress, writer, producer, manager. Mm -hmm. Your mom is a very, very famous uh, producer, writer, and radio host now. Mm -hmm. Your kids are doing all these things. How do you keep all these yeah. balls in the air, That's and how does that question. make you feel? I don't keep my balls in the air, thank you. <laughs> but under normal circumstances, anybody would be overwhelmed by anybody else who does, basically. Is a one man is a one is a one woman harmony. You, you know, you would you would be overwhelmed. Except when you get to know her, she's so superior to anybody you've ever met before that you just accept the fact that okay, honey, go with it. And I, think she, I think he likes you. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, there's. I think he really feels that way. But that doesn't mean it's easy to live with all that stuff. It is when the person you're with is living the life of of eight people. But you know, a lot of people do that these days, especially moms. And, it, and it's not just in show business. No. We I all really have don't think so. many, many somethings in the air. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that would be balls in the air. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <with> the <laughs> so what's the worst part of your day? What's the hardest challenge of your day? I can answer that question for her. Oh, Eric, you answer that question? It's when she finally has to shut down, turn off the computer, and turn off the lights. That's the hardest moment for her out there. And I don't it, think that ever happens. And it comes between 1.30 and 3.30 every a.m. That's so when it comes. Where do you find the time to, quote, just be alone, be together, share whatever needs to be shared? Our mornings. And location, Our mornings. on location. And location. 
if he's doing a film on location, are you there? Yeah, I go with Every him, second. and I always set up shop there. It's the only way to stay married, believe me. You both come from very interesting family backgrounds, and I'd like to talk a bit about it, and I'd like to start with Eric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I've read was, and maybe everybody else in the world knew this, but I didn't, that as a young boy, your parents divorced, and that you went to live with your dad, and that you didn't have much of a relationship with your mother or your sisters. Is that accurate? And how do you feel about that today as, an, as a man? That's accurate. And uh, how do I feel about it? It's yeah. what, I, what I was dealt. But I would imagine a lot of kids would have a lot of hard feelings and resentment and issues. And I can't imagine that, you know, it's, you know, it's like a not nice story of the parent trap where they go separate ways and I take this kid and I take right. this kid. How can parents do that? Cause I don't think I like your parents. I, 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 don't, I don't think I do either. But, uh, but I understand them, you know, being in my 40s. I understand their mistakes. I don't condone them, but I understand them. And, uh, and I'm not angry with either of them anymore. I think, I think, I think they're both very foolish and very uh, emotionally unstable. But, and they were both uh, horrendous drunks, which is a big problem. But... Uh, but but uh, but besides that, they're great. <laughs> now you and, had you had your own problems, and they problems and they, with and, they and they meant well. I, even though that's a lame excuse, that's all they had to offer, brother. You had your own problems with alcohol, yes? No, I had no problems with alcohol. I, I was, I was, I was a doper. Drugs. I was a big doper. And how'd you get out of it? Uh, how'd I get out of it? I basically, I basically ruined every relationship I ever had, ruined my career, ruined everything. So I had nowhere to go but up. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't get up. Yeah, they don't get but, out of it. Yeah, how but, did you get out of it? Well, well, I married well. <laughs> Seriously, are you the reason? Are you the turnaround? I mean, I... I she's, she's how, why did you put up with it? Why did you marry somebody that was a doper and you knew you had... Right. What were you, what were you thinking? Part of, it, part of it was ignorance, because I've never done drugs or drunk alcohol. But the, th but the thing is, I, I, I really... There, there were a lot of things I learned in those early years with her, because I really didn't even know what I was looking at. But I think also, I'm a caregiver, a rescuer, it's, you know... It's it's that thing of, that you can <laughs> you can fix some a control freak you can fix somebody's pain. Well, you obviously did. Well, somewhat. I mean, because you know what, you can't. I was going like, to say. You feel you know you feel like you can That's and, the line. and I actually can't and you can't make someone well. There did get to be. A, I would be very drawn to these people. I'd hear about other women who really drew the line with the person. They watched themselves killing themselves with drugs or alcohol, and they said, "I love you. I'm going to go." get some help when you're well come back and I had that fantasy and and um, I wrote a book of letters to Eric in our own house I would write him letters which really the letters really tell the story of what it's, it's a like really to, live, cool book. to live with somebody who is a drug addict um, what's the book called it's it, it's called C to C because of our both of our names it was EDE but I was gonna pretend it wasn't about us <laughs> <laughs> you know, Eliza and Eric, because literally that's how we had to communicate. The scary stuff I could say in the letters, you know, like he missed the birth of our baby horse, you know, because he was getting high and when it was a long, long time ago. But um, I think that when it got to the point where really I couldn't tolerate it anymore, it happened to merge with a point where he couldn't either and he really got scared. And I think some of it also, by the way, was vanity. Um, he was going you know, because Eric's younger than I am, and there was a point, and he's beautiful, and he always looks great, but there was a point when there was too often that he'd look at himself and go, Yuck. <laughs> look like shit. What am <laughs> look I doing? And, you know, why do you want to go through that? And it was, seemed so, suddenly it was like simple. Just stop using whatever it was. And so <laughs> how hard was it? How long did it take? Well, uh... How much did it cost? Where did you have to go? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go anywhere. After you make that decision, it's made. It's just really making that decision. That's the big deal. So you've been sober and clean how long? 
No, no. Uh, I am not sober and clean in that I will smoke a joint. Oh, but you've got it under control. No, well, it, it, no it, it isn't about control or out of control. It's about the fact that that is nature's Prozac, and I know how to use it so it works for me. And uh, I don't walk around stoned all day. Okay, when but you do consider yourself an addict. Uh, I was born an addict, yeah. Okay. Do he knows you, he's not sober. He knows the difference. Okay. Yeah. So All the issues. And this is a hard question, but if you're highly an anxious over something and you've got an audition for a major part... you got to grin and bear it. Do you go in there stoned? You can't. You can't. Okay. But here's what, here's what I used to do. The more, the more important my meeting, the higher I would get. And so I'd walk into meetings, and of course everybody but me knew I was wrecked. And they would say, excuse you, and I would leave and think, oh, and okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, when I got hold of that, I got hold of a lot. And uh, uh, pot is my Prozac. Uh, pot works for me. And Does I tried Prozac. I tried Prozac, and Prozac doesn't work for me. So, you know, it's whatever works I, for My opinion of marijuana is this. First of all, Eric, you, isn't, it isn't about the drug you're using. And he, but he used to use drugs that were really, really bad and caused, you know, really severe behavior problems. Such as? Uh, cocaine and, and alcohol. Um, cocaine and speed of the bad ones, though. Yeah, and whatever, pills. I mean, like, for instance, for him, he has a very bad reaction to over-the-counter sleep medications, to benzodiazepines, for instance, like Fries Xanax, and then to things like Unisom. I mean, would cause a terrible mood thing afterwards. And we had to study Andrew Weil and other things to really discover that's what was chemically happening. But the fact is, here's what I think. You know how they say you are what you eat? Well, you are what you consume. Marijuana is a weed, and it can turn your life into a weed garden. There's no question. That just strangles out all the nutritious things. You see yourself doing these grandiose things. You don't actually go do them. It's an insidious drug because it, people can think it's not a drug, and it works its way into your life, and it, you can become terribly dependent on it. It's to the point where you, it can regulate your moods and your reactions such that only when you're stoned and the second you're not, you decompose, and it's as if you took something agitating your own chemical you, you know, you don't, you can't balance, but, however, there are, you know, Eric has lots of depression issues and stuff, and when he's gone to doctors, they've wanted to medicate, and they've tried those head meds and whatever, and they're just simply a way less effective, with lots of side effects, so it's kind of like pick your side effect. I mean, for every effect, there's a side effect, and, you know, it's a struggle. I feel that there is a huge divide in America, more so than there has been in my lifetime, between the political parties. You're right. And I am frankly horrified on both the left and the right at the name calling. So I guess my question is, what needs to be changed? Well, I don't think that Congress or the American people will ever, will ever be swindled again by Mr. Bush. That be because 9-11, he got a, a blank check and an okay to do anything he wanted to war-wise. I have to share with you that my life changed on 9-11. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call at 6 in the morning from a neighbor who said, turn on the television, and I witnessed it. And that day, I think I went from a liberal Democrat to a moderate, to a conservative Republican by 12 noon. Wow, why? I was so horrified by the images of horror and death and destruction mm -hmm. perpetrated by extremism unchecked. And never in my entire vivid imagination would I ever have thought that anything so horrific could happen. It made me think that the world is not a very nice place and that people haven't changed enough in 2,000 years or 5,000 years mm -hmm. and that unfortunately there are people on the planet that only understand force and war and killing. And they cannot be talked to, convinced, cajoled, bought, paid for, promised or otherwise to try and get along. And this was the ultimate example of that to me. And as a result of it, despite whatever people think about the lies in the political system right now, that have been perhaps perpetrated on the American public, the Iraqi public, the European mm -hmm. continent, we, ha we face real, 
real danger in the world. And I think it has to be dealt with with a very strong and purposeful hand. The only problem is escalation has never worked and isn't working in this case. The, the true strong party, and someone has to do it, is the one who's going to say, we will not deal with it, things this way. Now, this would be our end of the week meeting about, have you read all your stuff or have you done your homework? OK, swear you didn't send me that balance. Look, I have always told you the truth, even though you've always hated it. Why should I talk to you? To drive me crazy. In that department, you need no help from me. Thank you. I'll treasure those words until the day I hang up this phone. Click, click. The big question is this, and it will be the deciding factor, I believe, in the November election. Mm -hmm. Should America be policing the world? Absolutely not. It, uh, we're not everybody's parent. And uh, we're the, uh, the youngest like a child on the earth. So we should not be so cocky. What change would you like to see to improve the situation? Well, we have to give back uh, what we took. We slaughtered a city. We have to rebuild the city. That's first. Okay, so we rebuild the city. It costs whatever it costs. Then what? Then, well, we, just, then we just say, mm -hmm. have and fun, what, people. And what, and what comes with... Uh, and then what about all these factions, the Shiites and the comes blah, with the blah, rebuilding blah. is education and all kinds of things that go with that, which also uh, encompass religion and all kinds of other things. Education, combined with the free press, are the two most important things in the world, wherever you are. Good on you, man. Where, yeah. whatever, wherever you are. But they don't have that. They don't. Their children, especially their female children, don't get educated. It's you know. I mean, they have used that as a political PowerPoint in justifying the invasion and the war. And I know that that we're freeing these 24 million oppressed people from a dictator, and we're going to open up schools for the children, and we're going to change their lives. I happen to agree with you that that isn't so easy to do because they're entrenched but that in has a to be done first. 1500 year old religious tradition that mm -hmm. is not going to just change like right, that. Right. But education, free press. Can, can Americans provide that to people such as this? It's the only thing that you can give them. It's the only thing that, that, that we can bring them. The only is problem education is and free press. Everything else they have to do for themselves. Do they care about justice? Do they care about fair play? I, I don't think, know. I think Do they care? If they got to it? taste it, they would, sure. Anybody would if they got to taste it. First of all, there has to be de-escalation, de serious de-escalation. We cannot be supporting anybody who's at war in the Middle East. I mean, just stop. Whether we believe in their side or not, the taking of sides has to stop. Well, wait a minute. You just said something very dangerous. If we stop taking any side at all in the Middle mm -hmm. East, then Israel will be totally overrun, and the only democratic country in the Middle East will be swallowed up and gone. Israel is a militant, is, has gotten a little bit too militant for my taste. It's real unfortunate, because the whole basic spirit of that place, I think, has been supplanted. And now you're talking about people who are looking for blood. That's only a faction of the state of Israel. It's not the entire state. I there are many people there that are as passionate as you about the peace process. I think people have lost their minds. In other words, yeah, but you it's been can't that way for so long. How can we just say we're going to just not be involved? Uh, there, because there's. I, I think that's very difficult. But look how look what we were able to pull. We went over. We spent a ton of money and went and destroyed an entire country, and captured Saddam Hussein and killed a bunch of people. I and mean, we can do it. That's the other thing that's interesting you say about education. 9-11, the actual doing of it, was absolute genius. It was one of the best executed events in history. Completely wrong. All this amazing education and intelligence and coordination and, and unity directed in a horrific direction. So in other words, the capacity to do great is also there. Where does this process begin? How do you impact? I, I am a pacifist. I mean, an old-fashioned pacifist. That means no violence, period. Find another solution. I went to the UN school, by the way, to the United Nations International School in New York. And as a child, I remember being very afraid it was the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. and thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen to my mommy and daddy? I mean, it's very basic. And then we would visit the UN constantly. I thought, oh, all these people, at least one representative from each country can sit and talk. Everything's going to be okay. 
we have to get back to that. As hokey as it sounds, we can't beat up our kids in our homes and make them angry people who go out looking for a fight. It all has to stop. All the violence has to stop. Let's switch gears. Education, health care, jobs. Mm -hmm. Why are we having so many problems when we have so much wealth and so much opportunity? Why is it We have so much hurting? greed, too. And also, because yeah. everybody wants all that wealth to go where they want it to go, as opposed well, to... Well, who's everybody and where do they right. want it to go? Everybody, be, be it all the good guys want it to go, to go one way, all the bad guys another way, all the medium guys another okay, way. Okay, devil's that's advocate, that's devil's that's advocate, that's advocate conservative too. devil's advocate yeah. says, I don't want to spend any more tax dollars because the government doesn't know how to spend the money. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's being wasted on X, Y, Z. They don't know what to do with it. The mm -hmm. programs aren't working. The poor aren't being helped. And the big issue is the word entitlement. This is the big catchphrase on the right, that the massive population of our democratic society feels entitled to be taken care of via healthcare, education, mm -hmm. welfare, blah, blah, blah. In other Benefits. words, you're paying and somebody else is getting. And but everybody's paying. No, everybody, everybody paying. isn't no. paying. That's the problem. You're paying, you're paying, Dennis is paying, right. Everybody I'm paying. paying. We're all I'm paying. not paying as much as you are, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's too many people that aren't paying that are taking. How do you, how do you bring them into the system? so that it isn't so much of a drain mm -hmm. and the things start to work again. Education, healthcare, these things will work if the system is not overburdened on the take versus give side. The reason we don't have the money is we're spending it all on ways to kill each other. That money is there. It's being spent on the wrong things. And that's, and I that's the point. believe in the programs, but the programs should be incentive programs. And they should include programs to help people get sober. They should include, it should be something like, I'll come halfway if you come halfway. Do you still, with all these problems, do you still see America as a great country? <laughs> Love this place. I don't see it as a great country. I've got to tell you. You don't. See okay. it as a, as a place with great potential. Politically, you don't, you're saying. I think that there's some things that we really should not indulge ourselves in doing anymore. It's wrong. And that stuff, I, I'll reserve my, my label of great until some, some real work gets done. Well, I love this country to death. I love how it looks. I love what it offers. I love uh, what, I can, what I can actually go do here. I like everything about it. Talk to me about your new sitcom. Less than perfect, which it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have an incredible cast of people. Uh, they're all very funny people, and they're all very talented. My favorite, I have to cop, is Zach Levi. He cracks me up all day, every day. I love him dearly. But uh, our whole cast is wonderful, and we're all very good friends. And you enjoy going to work? You enjoy the process? It's hardly working. We, we work like 30 hours a week, and... Uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's like a crime, kind of. <laughs> would you see yourself staying with it for a number of years? Would you? Would that be a good thing for you? If they'll have me. If they'll have you? Yeah. End the interview by telling each other something that you'd like to share with 150 million viewers. <laughs> I love my wife like I love my life, and I love living. Wow. That's a Hallmark yeah. card. That's, that's, that's and what pretty about, good. What about you? Bring it back to basics. Be kind, because that is at the center of everything. Or, as we say at home, the Beatles said it best, all you need is love. Believe it or not, our goal, and I use the word our because it's not just me as the host, it's the entire production crew, the staff, everybody working on this project, our goal is to make a difference. We don't want to waste our time or your time with super promotion and garbage and fluff and frankly lies and baloney on television. This show is about substance and style.